In order to understand the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, one must understand the discrete logarithm problem in maths. The logarithmic function follows the concept of a trapdoor function. A trapdoor function is easy to compute in one direction, yet difficult to compute in the opposite direction. Let's visualize it this way. Given two teaspoons of coffee, one teaspoon of sugar and half cup of milk, you can make coffee. Nice and easy. Now given the same coffee, can you guess the exact amounts used? Modulo operation is an operation where the result is the remainder of the division operation. We say 13 mod 5 is congruent to 3 because 13 equals 5 by 2 plus 3. What if we want to find x such that 5 to the power x mod 13 is congruent to 11? Let's try many values for x and check after how many tries we find the answer. After 8 tries, we will find that for x equals 8 we will get 5 to the power x mod 13 is 11. Now here is where it gets interesting. Let's say we have x as g to the power y mod p. But now we have p is a very large prime number and g and x are also very large numbers. And by large, we mean, really large. Imagine for example p is 2048 bits. Can you find y given these circumstances? This is the gist of the discrete logarithm problem, and even with the current generation computers it would take a very long time to solve. And one of the reasons prime numbers are used is to avoid repeating patterns. For example, let's take p equals 12, a non-prime number. As you can see, use of this number leads to repeating patterns, and in cryptography, randomness is critical. On the other hand, Let's take for example p equals 11, a prime number. Notice that now, in contrast, there are no patterns. The discrete logarithm problem is the base of the Diffie-Hellman exchange algorithm, which was invented in 1976. Diffie-Hellman key exchange can be used to securely exchange a secret key over an insecure network. It works using the concepts of prime numbers and modulo operations. First, JP and Joe both agree on two numbers, G and P, a large prime number. Those will be shared over the public internet. Then, each of JP and Joe will generate a random private key which will not be shared over the internet. After that, JP computes his public key, which will be the following equation, G, raised to the private key, mod P. Then, he will send his public key to Joe. Similarly, Joe also computes his public key the same way and sends it to JP. To recap, until now, both parties have shared over the public internet the params G and P, and their respective public keys. The private keys were not shared. Now let's see how the shared secret will be derived from these params. JP will compute the shared secret on his side using the following equation. S equals the public key of Joe raised to JP's private key mod P. Joe also computes the shared secret on his side with the same equation, using JP's public key and his private key. The secret key they have each calculated independently will be the same. Let's explain the maths behind this. We can substitute in each side the public key by its equation to find that the values will indeed be identical. This explains how both JP and Joe contribute to generating a shared secret value without actually transmitting it. Given p, g, and y, it is very easy to compute s. But over the public internet, Chatty can only see p and g, and it will be very hard for him to compute y. Computing y is the discrete logarithm problem we just talked about earlier. In the TLS handshake, the shared secret will be fed into what's called a key derivation function. The KDF takes as input the shared secret, and other params such as assault and some additional app-specific info. With all these inputs, the KDF will produce many keys, for example the MAC key, and the symmetric key used for data encryption. So that's it. I hope you are enjoying this mini-series about TLS. For any questions, please ask in the comments section. See you in the next lectures.